Thank you, Brian. And good afternoon, everyone. So before we get uh, there, let's back up a step and a bit more. OK. So speaking as a technical writer, even if I'm a relatively uh, new one, I think it's safe to say at this point in the game, our discipline is, is pretty well acquainted with the challenges that you, you encounter when you take a large chunk of information and you try to make it more usable, whether it's by creating categories or hierarchies or structuring it in some other way. It's that basic work of information architecture, where we, as Christina Wodki has put it, we help someone understand something more deeply through organization. I imagine that many of us have approached this topic, uh, this route, through the Polar Bear book. Quick show of hands, how many are familiar with uh, the Polar Bear book? Yeah, reasonable number. It's a, probably safe to say it's kind of a leading uh, and an early text in the field of IA, information architecture. It's recently had a bit of a refresh. Uh, the Polar Bear is now in color. <laughs> um, there are other texts on IA too, of course. I don't mean to oversimplify, but I get the impression from reading these guys that we're, we're comfortable with IA work as something that happens at like a high level. And the subtitles on these ones, um, they kind of reflect that. Of course, you might not be able to read it at the back of the room. Information architecture for the world wide web. And more recently, for the web and beyond. The case I'd like to make in this talk is that good things happen also when we apply these broad IA principles at that much smaller level. Yes, that is a baby polar bear. At this, these much smaller levels can include the paragraph, the sentence, and even the phrase. So I started thinking about these little guys last December. Our docs team was putting together just an informal annual letter sent out to a few teams internally. And we were just describing a few of the more interesting things uh, that we've been up to that year. And part of that letter was a series of stats about Doc's readership in that calendar year 2015. And, and one stat in particular really jumped out at me. It was the total time, cumulative time, that all readers spent reading the Docs that year. And I, I won't mention the specific number, but it was way bigger than I expected. Decades and decades of time just spent reading uh, from the user base in that single calendar year of 2015. And it, it got us thinking um, that suddenly we had a, a performance issue, perhaps, as much as we did a content issue. Engagement was happening at this level where it might start to make sense to think about incremental improvements. Um, even a small gain in reading efficiency could benefit the reading base as a whole, um, alongside the more traditional architectural work that we might do. And this was in keeping with my, uh, with my role as an editor at that time. After all, editing is just refactoring code designed to run on someone else's brain, after all. Others have approached the same idea from a, a different point. This is Jeannie Fanestock. Uh, she studies rhetoric at Maryland. Um, rhetorical acts pretty much all come down to human brains acting on other human brains. So this became a starting point. When faced with this task of improving sentences for use at scale, we assume that language is kind of like brain code. And Performance matters. We had a lot of brains reading a lot of words. So what editorial decisions could we make so that those brains jobs were, were all easier? First, we had to learn a little more about how sentence processing actually works. And this is a, a vast field uh, of study. I'm, I'm sorry if there are any proper uh, linguists in, in the crowd. I'll buy you a drink after or something. Uh, just <laughs> go along with it, OK? Two key points, though. Syntax is really important, and ambiguity is a big blocker for sentence processing. And it's easy to take that for granted because human brains are really good at dealing with ambiguity and overcoming ambiguity. And as writers, we can kind of get a sentence like 80 or 90% of the way there, and the reader will you know, get the job done. They'll finish it for us. But the question becomes, why, why make our readers' brains do that extra interpretive work when they don't have to? We could take a look at an example here. This is a textbook example of something called temporary ambiguity. And it's often a part of sentence processing, um, even when there aren't like glaring grammatical errors. In this case, 
The defendant examined by the lawyer was unreliable. The processing brain, when it reads those first three words, the defendant examined, we think the defendant is doing that, the action in the past tense. But then when the sentence is complete, we realize the meaning was totally different. It was another agent, the lawyer, who was doing the examining. So the processing brain bets on one interpretation at that early stage of the sentence and then has to reanalyze it when it gets the rest of the information. Temporary ambiguity. So if we know that syntax is important, ambiguity is a blocker, then let's put them together and see what happens. This is where I'm going to make the case that information microarchitecture comes in. So um, for the rest of the time that we've got here, let's take a look at a few different syntactic cues, little grammatical um, oddities that impact processing, whether by building or breaking the kind of internal architecture of a sentence, that microarchitecture. We're going to focus on one particular type. Uh, I call it a conditional statement. So it begins with if. If you need help, read the docs. So we'll start with a simple form and then work our way up. But note the basic structure here. There's two parts to the sentence, right? There's the condition and then there's the outcome. So in this case, like the previous example, there is some temporary ambiguity that's, uh, that's alive here. But it's, it's very slight. It comes from the brain having to figure out which part of the sentence is the condition and which part is the outcome of that condition. And if we think of how the sentence might unfold in slow motion, there's a potential for the processing brain to start reading that second verb phrase as part of a series instead of as like the closing outcome for that initial condition. It doesn't help that the two elements are like grammatically parallel too. Um, but imagine the brain didn't know there was a period at the end there the sentence could be heading towards something like, if you need help, read the docs, and still don't know what to do, then phone a friend. Again, we think of that sentence kind of unfolding in slow motion, and we identify those little areas of, of temporary ambiguity. And by the end of the sentence, of course, I mean, the processing brain confirms what the intended meaning was. It's not too great a leap. We've run out of words, so, well, that latter part must be the outcome. Again, brain's pretty great at resolving ambiguity. But there's a small word we can add um, to avoid that temporary ambiguity altogether. If we add a then, right at that moment after the comma, it kind of locks down the interpretation of that sentence. It serves the architectural function, I would argue, um, of defining a boundary between two pieces or two different types of information. So then the processing brain doesn't have to figure out for itself that the latter part is the um, is the outcome. It knows as soon as it hits that then. So stepping back, we can see how this is sort of an IA problem, right? Um, there's different chunks of information and the user has to try and fit it into a different bucket, a different container. Let's push on with a, a more, uh, a little more extended example. S similar to the last. If you need help, read the docs or call support. Um, as a side note, when you're dealing with like spoken language, um, there's cues, like tonal cues that signify we're dealing with the condition. You can, if you need help, and then you're, you're primed, you're, you're waiting for the condition to end uh, to get the outcome. But on the page, we don't have the luxury of tone. And in this example, uh, we can see what happens. The intended meaning is... Um, it's achievable without any real trouble, of course. Uh, the, the ambiguity is temporary and, and if, if noticeable at all. But I would argue that the temporary ambiguity is a little less temporary here in this more extended example than it was in the first. There's now three elements that are potentially in series, so it just takes that much more processing time to sort them and to figure out how they all fit together. Once again, by the time the processing brain gets to the end of the sentence, yeah, we get it. But look how the user journey of this sentence changes when we actually add in that then. The interpretation, that risky, and misguided interpretation is uh, eliminated. So the syntax and the grammar we would use as a writer or an editor basically um, prevents the processing brain from having to pursue that alternate meaning. <laughs> 
last example. This is one from our own uh, set of documentation, emerged from one dark corner or another. Um, following the previous examples, we probably wonder if the outcome starts there. After we, we encounter that if, the processing brain, I believe, is, is always looking for the then, to close that condition, whether it's Im implied, as we've seen in the previous examples, or it's actually an explicit then situated in the sentence. With this fine example, again, we see these multiple possibilities for interpretation. The, the processing brain is still trying to find that boundary between condition and outcome. And in this case, there's um, three, in the first part of the sentence, three phrases that are parallel, single quotes, double quotes, ampersands. And then when it hits the second comma, we get another phrase. It's effectively parallel with the first, group filtering. That second comma introduces that other possibility of um, adding a then to kind of circumvent that risk of misreading. So the sentence processing, um, like there's some ambiguity that remains. The processing brain still has to work out where to place double quotes and ampersands. But the, and so in this last example, we eliminate some of the ambiguity by deploying that then instead of leaving it up to the reader. But notably, we can't omit or circumvent all of the ambiguity in this case, barring some major rewriting, which let's be honest, would um, probably not hurt. So of course we wanted to test this. But we weren't entirely sure what the best way to test this was. How can we effectively measure um, these kind of cognitive impacts based on little tweaks to, to copy? So here's what we did. Uh, we used a concordance tool to find the pages with the most ifs. Um, and then we ran A-B tests, basically. One version of the page would have all the thens missing, and then the B version, all of thens would be present. And we compared reader engagement with those two versions, the A and the B. We chose um, engagement as the primary metric here, based on the simple assumption that if the brain is having to work harder to process these, these sentences, even if it's just in a, in a very minimal way, um, the reader um, who the brain is driving is going to be less likely to click on something, just because there's that a little more cognitive debt, a little more cognitive load. So the readers who are clicking more are those who are exhausted less, if that makes sense. So what happened? Um, across the four tests we ran, there was an improvement across the board. It was very small, um, perhaps flirting with statistical insignificance. But the numbers were still there. There was a trend, and, and some of them were, were juicy enough to, to pique our interest. Um, so it's something we're, we're continuing to pursue. Um, and again, hearkening back to that earlier idea, at scale, when you're communicating at scale, even these little microscopic gains, um, this is just one particular form of ambiguity that we tried to weed out. If you're deploying across multiple forms, then you would have uh, that much more to gain. The purpose of this talk is not to recommend that you use one particular structure or another. It's rather to demonstrate just a few things. First, how we can start to think about editing with a view to the reading habits of human brains. Um, and again, make the point that that's maybe a little more important um, when communicating at large scale. Next, I hope to show that every sentence has a user journey. We see these sentences unfolding in slow motion. And last, it's polar bears all the way down. These IE principles that work at uh, the, the scale of the World Wide Web, the web and beyond, um, can have really positive impacts if we focus at that micro level. Thank you. <laughs>